Like to welcome everybody out tonight to night service. Uh, this is Faith General Baptist Church, and we're here for our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, this is an open Bible study, so if you have any questions or comments, feel free to make them known in the comment box, and we're going to do our best to uh, answer those during our live service uh, uh, this week. Uh, each and every week, we'll have, we usually have uh, trivia questions and things like that. Uh, so uh, just a little something to get us into the Word of God a little bit deeper and I, you know what I think right now that we can all begin to realize that one of the most important things as a Christian today is to get into the Word of God. And uh, what better way to know what God expects out of you uh, than to get into His Word and know what it says. So tonight, uh, uh, we ask that you would just give us your uh, uh, undivided attention uh, to the Word of God. And uh, uh, Brother Ron will do his best to begin to teach it to you. And the Holy Spirit, I believe, will be able to uh, reveal it to you. So, uh, God's chosen. And we as Christian people today are God's chosen people. Just as they were. But the simple fact of it is mankind had not changed and we're still continuing evil. Without the love of God in our heart, without the word of God to show us the right way, uh, to show us who God is, what God is, uh, we can't be pleading unto him. So, the Exodus started out with the law, the things that were separate from the rest of the world. And Leviticus, Leviticus is continuing on in the same way. The 29th verse of the 16th chapter of Leviticus. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth with you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that you may be cleansed from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be the Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your soul, souls by statute forever. And the priest whom he shall anoint, whom he shall anoint, and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead, shall make an atonement and shall put upon the linen cloths, even the holy garments, and he shall make an atonement for the whole, holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, and for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priest, and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you, to make an atonement for your children of for the children of Israel, for all their sins, once a year, and he did as he did as the Lord commanded Moses. We'll stop there just for a second. A question or comment? Again, the Day of Atonement. Uh, once a year, uh, the priest would go in and make an atonement for the sins of the whole nation of Israel, and it would go to the next year. Again, never were the sins forgiven all the sacrifices, rites, and rituals that they went through. Their sins were not forgiven. They were pushed forward. They were all pushed forward. Uh, again, we was talking in, in the scripture about he'd make atonement for the uh, sanctuary, make atonement for the tabernacle, for the altar, for the priest. Again, the last three chapters that we studied in Leviticus told us how the priest had to make an atonement to herself, how they had to cleanse herself, separate herself from the world, and had to, how they had to go in before these uh, ceremonies and cleanse the tabernacle, the altar, the mercy seat, 
Everything had an order. It had to be done that way. And that's what he's saying here once again. But the reason it had to be done that way because, uh, again, they spent all these thousands of years, mankind had up to this time, uh, the children of Israel, over 400, about 430 years, I think it was, they were slaves of Egypt. So all they knew was idolatry. All the false gods, all the false worship, all the evil that the Egyptians and the rest of the world had taught them. So God is telling you, you make an atonement. You cleanse yourself. And that hasn't changed today. Even today, this said it would be a statute unto you, make atonement for the children of Israel and all their sins once a year. And so he did. It would be an eternal thing. It would be an everlasting thing until Jesus Christ came and did the work that he did on Calvary. His death, burial, and resurrection. That's, that's, how it, that's how they were to uh, be obedient unto God. And they would be that way. These same rites and rituals had to be uh, accepted, performed once a year until Jesus Christ, the true sacrifice, the true perfect lamb, made a sacrifice for us and ended it all and made it, made it a simple and easy way for us to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and to be pleasing unto God. Uh, anybody have a question or a comment? If not, we'll move on to 17. Uh, we need to remember all, again, I, I, I can't stress it too much. Everything we've read so far in, in the earlier part of the Bible up to Leviticus has shown us who we are, what we are, and how God is. Just that simple. We begin to see who God is, what He is, what He expects, and how He, if you would, how He does business. Uh, but basically, Leviticus gets down into the point that it opens up the basic truths. I can understand what we've read and what everything we've all talked about is the basic truth. But it's the basic truth for Christian living today. You know, so many people say, well, the Old Testament has nothing to do with us. We're a New Testament church. We don't need that. But the basic <coughs> of Christian living is set for us in the Old Testament. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons and to all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, say. Again, it's important for us to remember, God spoke to Moses, Moses spoke to Aaron, then Aaron and his children, the priest, carried out the word of God. Instructions, you know, the spiritual leaders of Israel. Verse 3. What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth by an ox, a lamb or a goat in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to, an offer, to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood shall be imputed in unto that man. He, he has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. To the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, and offer them, offer them for a peace offering unto the Lord. <coughs> and the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord, at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto the Lord. Question or comment? Again, the law said, God said, that when they killed it, they had to bring it to the tabernacle, to the door of the tabernacle, where the blood uh, could be sprinkled on the doors of the tabernacle before that eat 
Again, this was done because of the background they had in Egypt. The things that they were taught and the way they were uh, brought up for 400 years. You know, face it, over 400 years, they left off who God was. They barely knew who Abraham was. The promises were made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We know by studying the Word of God that uh, when Joseph died, children of Israel was such a mob, such a crowd, such a multitude, that they made them slaves. They were afraid of them. They couldn't handle them. There were so many millions of them that the Egyptians had to do something to make them be obedient. Uh, when they worshipped all the gods of, of the Egyptians, thank you, uh, all the ones that uh, the 12 plagues, you know, frogs, alligators, all these things, the blood, all the 12 uh, plagues that was brought upon them had to deal with who, who the Egyptians worshipped and how they worshipped. And that's what Israel knew. So the same thing happens to us today in our lifetime, in our lives. Before we become Christians, uh, what we know is... Uh, what we're taught by the world. Our hearts is hardened. Uh, we don't know any better. And then we begin to, uh, once we hear the word of God, we begin to contemplate. We begin to think on who we are and what we are. And thankfully, sooner or later, I realized that I was lost and undone. I turned my heart over to God. Uh, but without them having to do this, they would lose sight of what God they should worship. What God provided them with their food. What God provided them with everything they had in their life. To separate them from their past. And we as Christians today, once we become a Christian, we begin to be filled with the Spirit. We begin to read the Word of God and we separate ourselves from our past. People will never forget who we were. You know. The world remembers us for what we were, just like them. But God forgives, puts them in the sea of forgiveness. <laughs> we become a new creature. But we then know who did that for us. We know who brought us peace. It wasn't things of the world. It wasn't our friends or our family of the world. Even our Christian family, it wasn't them that brought us peace. It was God. And we need to be separated through prayer and study in the Word of God, just as they had to do this to separate themselves and realize that God is God. Any question or comment? Again, to bring, bring into the fact of one God. Their God. If we'll go to Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, uh, the 20th chapter of Ezekiel, the 6th through the 8th verse. Again, this is a few years after uh, Ezekiel, probably closer to 2000. Uh, but it says, In that day I lifted up my hand unto them to bring them forth out of the land of Egypt into the land that I had despised for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abomination of his eyes, and defile not yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. But again, this shows us who God was, what he'd done for them. Now we want to see again who we are. We'd be nice to say who they were. The world out there is a terrible bunch. No good, never has been, never will be. But the simple fact of it is we're all guilty of sin. We're all guilty of the same things. But they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. 
They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. Wait to the comment. <clears throat> Again, it sounds harsh, it sounds terrible, but even in the New Testament, we find out men were still worshiping idols. Uh, Brother Billy and, and Brother Justin on their uh, Back to the Old Past, that on some scriptures that was talking about these things. Uh, we have to separate ourselves. We have to be, if we're a Christian, we have to be a Christian. We have to understand that God is God. And God expects something of us. You know, so many people today say, well, God's love. Just go ahead and do what you want to, when you want to. It'll be all right. God loves you. God does love us. God gave his only begotten son. God will never stop loving us. Think about that. God will never stop loving us. But if we die in sin and go to hell, God will still love us, but we'll still be in hell. God's a loving God, but he's a just God. He's an angry God. We just read in Ezekiel where he done all these things for those chosen people. They rebelled and his anger came back. He's an angry God. He's a jealous God. If we go to hell, it's our choice. God would never send nobody to hell. He loves us that much. He would never send us. But he'll allow you to go if that's what you want. What's your comment? It seemed hard to them to be, they had to be reminded this way, but we as Christian people today still need daily reminders. Who we are, what we are, uh, the best we can ever be. Is a sinner saved by grace. Think about that. Saved by grace. Separated from who we once were. But we were still sinners. No questions, no comments. Let's go to verse 7. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. Question or comment? In other words, as the Egyptians worshipped all the things of nature. We know later on the Greeks, uh, all those had, again, nature, uh, mythical gods, all these things set up. This was done just for that reason that he, that he talked about. Uh, not under devils. And again, it was said, uh, I don't know if it was Brother Billy or Brother Justin talking about Anything we put before God is an idol. And it's just that simple. If we put, uh, just say baseball, one of the most innocent games, I mean, you can't, there's, there'd be no sin in anybody here going out playing baseball. If that's all you did. But when you begin to worship and put that before God, it's a sin. It's an idol. And it has to be done away with. In uh, Acts, chapter verses uh, 19 and 20 this is in the New Testament church this is where they were uh, establishing churches throughout the world uh, they started in, in the land of Israel so the Jews received the plan of salvation first. And then through the Apostle Paul and others, even, even uh, Simon Peter went to the Gentile people. And there was a big argument, always been a big argument, how to worship God. 
Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, the first five books of Moses. It's going to tell us who God is and what God expects of us. You said, no, that's to, the, that's to the children of Israel. That's to his people. We have to be obedient to the word of God. But the problem was here, uh, we as Gentile people were looked down as dogs and we weren't as good as the Jews in their sight. Uh, and they wanted, uh, after a, a Gentile person accepted Jesus Christ, they wanted things added to them. Another burden, another uh, weight that would easily be settled. But here, here is the the judgment of godly men, and I believe it to be uh, James. He said, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. The very things that Leviticus has taught us. That's what James is telling us. Is Christian people, newborn babies in Christ. Don't worry about nothing else. Just keep yourself from idols. Don't get polluted by the world, by the world of idols. Abstain from fornication. All the things that is natural to mankind. Stay away from it. You know, we are no longer just uh, in the physical. Uh, we're spiritual. Any question or comment on that? If not, move on to verse 8 and 9. And thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man there be in the house of Israel or strangers which sojourn among you, that offers for burnt offering or sacrifice, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off among his people. Question or comment? Again, this was done that we don't get we don't lose sight of who we're worshiping. We're not going to lose sight, or they couldn't if they did it, as they were commanded. They could not lose sight of who their God was. Who did they worship? They worship the one true God, the great I Am. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 14, he says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from my daughters. Even in, in, in the New Testament, as far along as in Corinthians. The early church, it was still there. It's still here today. Uh, we have denominations. We have a, a sect of people that uh, worship statues. They do. Uh, they're of uh, some of them are of biblical people. But the Bible teaches us there's only one person to worship and that's God. And how do we get to God? The word of God has taught us all the way through through that man, Jesus Christ. That's who we worship. We praise the name of God and we live according to the life and words of Jesus Christ. Anybody have a question or comment? In 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, 14th verse where we want to start we'll go through the 14th through the 17th again when we're talking about God wants his people separated from the rest of the world their sacrifices their offerings had to be to God at, at the door of the tabernacle so everybody can see who they worship who they are what they are and again as we go through 2 Corinthians Paul says be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? 
And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, be you separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, I will receive you. I'm going to go ahead and read verse 18. It said, And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Question or comment? The simple fact of it is, our life has to be different than theirs. That's all. That's all he's saying. You know, don't get caught up in the sins of the world. <clears throat> it's easy. Again, we've said this time and time again, if you're around somebody that cusses all the time, the more you hear it and the more you're with it, over a period of time, it gets less offensive. Because that's what everybody's doing. We've all been there, you know, with people that just can't say anything. Not cussing, using the good Lord's name in vain. At first, you know, when they say it or whatever, it just, it just goes all over you. After a period of time, if you stay with those people all the time, next thing you know, it's not too bad. And if you're not careful, you'll get caught up in the same thing, using little smutty words or whatever that everybody else. But God warns us not to do that. Uh, it has a place for us today in everything. When we're with any unbeliever, but in our politics, our marriages, business work, and our everyday social life, we have to come out from among them and be you said. Anybody have a question or comment on that? If not, we'll go to verse 10. And whatsoever man there be in the house of Israel, of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Question or comment? Plain and simple. I've got some good friends that belong to a, a, a what I call a cult that tells you any blood, if you give it or receive it, you sin and you'll go to hell. Uh, they get that from part of these verses. But the simple fact of it is, we know without blood, I mean, cut your wrist, you're going to die. Sooner or later, the blood will drain out and you will die physically. And what God is saying here, the blood in the natural body keeps you alive. <coughs> but we realize today through the work all Leviticus, the work of Jesus Christ, the thing that gives us eternal life is the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why it was to be separated from the meat. Uh, and it, again, the meat wasn't always burned up. It was the blood that set the sweet Savior up to God. That's what he smelled. He was separated for that purpose. We need to understand that. Question or comment? We're quiet once tonight. Now we'll go on to verse 12. And therefore I said unto the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. And whosoever and whatsoever man 
their dead and children of Israel are the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catches any beast or fowl that may be, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. Question or comment? Again, this, this points to the simple fact that the blood made the atonement for them. The blood makes, of Jesus makes atonement for us. And the blood is what cleansed us. Uh, the blood of Jesus Christ is what has cleansed us from our sins. It's, it's just that simple. We need to understand that uh, no matter what we want to believe, or what we think, uh, the blood is precious to God. All the way back in uh, Genesis again, when Cain slew Abel, what did God say? His blood cries out from the ground. So from the very beginning of time, blood has been important. Blood has been the thing uh, of life. It's just always been that. In 1 John chapter 6, verse 53 through 56, it said, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life, you have no life in you. In you. Whosoever eateth my blood and drinketh, eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. I even know people of Christian denominations that say when they take the Lord's Supper uh, the bread actually turns when you, when you put it in your mouth and begin to eat it, it actually turns into flesh. And the wine that you drink the grape juice that we drink actually turns into blood. That's, that's not true. I, you know, nowhere in the Bible does it say that. What he's saying is, we've got to be, everything about us has to be about Jesus Christ and the Word of God. No, I, I, I've never, uh, I've never eaten blood pudding. I don't know if anybody here has. It's a big thing in the, Britain and part of the European countries is a, a del delicacy, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I've never, I've never eaten blood. Uh, like I say, I don't hunt anymore. But when I did hunt, I'd always cut or hang the animals up and let the blood drain from them. I just didn't open them up and start eating. You know, we drain the blood out. Uh, even, you know, used to when you kill hogs, when the weather stayed like it's supposed to, you hung them. You done cut the throats, got all the blood out, uh, but you hung them up overnight. Because it was still cold, they wasn't going to freeze, but it wouldn't ruin. And let all the, drug, the blood and the, the whatever drained from them, the meat tasted. What Jesus Christ is saying here again, not, you, you don't eat his actual flesh, but you, you take him in. You know, once you've eaten, say, a, a pig or a goat or a squirrel, whatever it is, it's in you. That's what Jesus Christ, the Word of God, is telling us that we need to have that in us. Everything about us, everything we eat and drink should be of Jesus Christ, not his actual blood, not his actual flesh. 
we should be full of and desire everything that he has to offer us. Anybody have a question or a comment? And again, if you, if you broke the law, if you disobeyed the word of God concerning the blood and the sacrifice of the animal that you was going to eat. See, now this animal, the animal that they had to take to the door of the tabernacle wasn't for a sacrifice. That was their food. No matter where they killed it, they had to take the blood to the temple, or to the tabernacle, because the temple wasn't built yet. But that's where God got the glory and the, and the honor from, from them taking it to Him, and them making the world know, having the world realize they were doing that to the one true God. Question or comment? And every soul that eateth that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beast, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Then shall he be clean. But if he washed him not, nor bathe his flesh, that he shall bear his iniquity. Question or comment? Again, no matter who you are, if you're one of God's children, or if you're a stranger that was traveling with you, touched and defiled yourself with a, a dead creature. <clears throat> it just died for whatever reason. You know, everybody's never been out in the country, in the woods, somewhere walked up on something that's just dead. Something that's just dead. I mean, they didn't have no marks on them or anything. They just died. Well, we have enough common sense today since we don't know what it's died from, it's done swelled up from the heat and all, we, you, don't, you don't mess with it. But you still come up on things that coyotes have killed. Whatever animal it might have been that killed it before its flesh. Uh, well, you still don't eat that. Uh, we joke all the time about roadkill. You know, road, roadkill stew and this and that. I, I don't know of anybody that's went down the highway and picked up a possum and took it home and ate it. Now, if you just run over it, maybe. But God has said this, telling his people here, telling everybody, no matter who you are, you understand this. Uh, any disobedience, such as, in this case, eating those animals, touching those animals, without worship, cleansing yourself, you will bear your iniquity. Again, if if I go out and sin today, my brother Christian won't be required of anything of that. It's not his problem. If he knows it, he'll pray for me. But God is saying, plain and simple, we today as Christian people, this, this is one of the biggest false doctrines going about our country, our land today is a civil fact uh, that uh, I've been saved and there's nothing that will ever separate me from God. Again, as we spoke earlier, there's nothing you can do to separate yourself from the love of God. But disobedience will bring upon the wrath of God. And a just and true judgment. Again, we can be in hell. It's by our choice. God still loves us. But 
he gave us, he loved us enough to, let us, to allow us to make a choice. And this shows us even today, we as Christian people must cleanse ourselves from sin every day. Why do we live a repentant life? It's called, I want to make heaven my home. A, a good friend of mine that believed that you couldn't do anything to separate yourself. Uh, him and some more of my friends ganged up on me and tell me how wrong I was to believe that God would ever allow me to go to hell. That what God did was perfect. He didn't make no mistakes. And I realized that God doesn't make a mistake. He sent his son uh, that all men could be saved. I accepted his son one day. But if I turn my back, I'm disobedient. And I don't repent of that. Said, so then he shall bear his iniquity. It's our choice. We don't have to die and go to hell. But if we want to, God will allow it. We need to understand once again uh, if you will, and I, and I know I'm referring back to Genesis a whole lot, but again, I, my, my belief has always led me to understand that our Christian life was set in order all the way back in Genesis. At the beginning. In the beginning. Uh, again, we, we spoke of Cain, Cain and Abel. Uh, God rejected Cain's offer. He said, well, hey, I, I believe something wrong, but I did it to the best of my ability. I truly believe that. Cain gave an offer. It wasn't what God accepted. Wouldn't be accepted of God. So we can believe what we want to. We can tell ourselves and we can tell everybody else, no matter what you believe, just stick to it and believe it with all your heart. It will all your heart and you'll be all right. That's not true. God rejects any disobedience from his word. His word says there's one God. His word says there's one way to get to heaven. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. And then, living an obedient and a repentant life. Even, you know, as we look back, even David, a man after God's own heart, in Psalms, what, 139 maybe? The last two verses. This is a man that God chose to be king. Man that God loved, and we know the Word of God teaches us that man that sinned and failed came short many times. But even he prayed, Search me, O God. Know my heart today. We can't go by our feelings. And a lot of people say, Well, I feel good about it. I live this way, and uh, I feel good about it. It's okay. The Bible teaches us God allow us to believe the lie of the dead. He'll turn us over to a reprobate mind. If you want to believe it, believe it. But understand this. Read the word of God. With a spiritual heart. And we'll all realize that it's only through the obedience to the word of God that we'll be pleased. Any questions or comments? If not,